Hello everyone and welcome back to our study in Malachi. This is number three in our series. The last time we were together, uh, we ended in the second chapter of Malachi. We ended after verse nine. Uh, we were talking about the tribe of Levi through the priest came through that tribe and we ended with the thought that Aaron came through that tribe of Levi and he was the first high priest and his sons that followed him, his descendants, but that Jesus uh, is now the high priest, that we do not have to go through uh, a priest or a high priest, a human being, we may now come directly to him because of what he did on the cross. He abolished that old law, and now we live in newness of life in him with the Holy Spirit living within us when we become a child of God, and we may communicate directly with him. Wow. You just stop for a second and think of that. We may communicate directly for him for centuries in the Old Testament. People could not do that. They had to go through the Levitical priesthood in order to do that. Oh, that is something, isn't it, where we, where we are today. Uh, picking up our story in Malachi chapter 2 and beginning with verse 10, it says this, Are we not all children of the same Father, and are we not all created by the same God? Now, we know that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are uh, brothers and sisters together, and God is our Father. It's referring here to God as Creator God. In that sense, everybody is his children in that sense. He created everybody, but we only become, as we know, a member of his family when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal savior and believe and accept what he did for us to give us forgiveness of sins, that we may live in a holy manner be before God and with God for eternity. Whew. That's just something. Kind of gets you every time, doesn't it? It goes on to say, why do we betray each other? We violate the covenant of our ancestors. Throughout the Old Testament, if you read, you see that God made a covenant with his people. The covenant in the most simplistic terms was that he will be God and they would be his people and they would just be unto each other. But the people broke it continually, time and time again, turning their back on God and even worshiping false idols, just forgetting him. Oh, this happened time and time again. Verse 11 it says, Judah has been unfaithful. A detestable thing has been done in Israel and Jerusalem. The men of Judah, they've defiled the Lord's beloved sanctuary by marrying women who worship idols. And again, this is what's happened. They were, they were actually uh, becoming married. Remember, the physical union, union is a picture of our spiritual union with Jesus. Jesus is uh, coming back for the bride of Christ, and that's us, the church. Everyone who knows Jesus Christ, we are collectively the bride of Christ. And Jesus, our husband, is coming back for us. Could be any moment. Um, and Judah and, and the, the tribe of Judah, the people, as happened many times in the Old Testament, here they are doing it again. They've, turned, they've married women that are tempting them to worship false gods, idols, things. They've turned from God deliberately. Now let's stop here because... Who is this Judah? We talked about Levi last week. We have to talk about Judah. Let's go to his mother first. I think that would be a good place to start when we think about Judah. Many of you know the story. It's recorded uh, in Genesis about uh, Jacob and his 12 sons who became the tribe of Judah. We mentioned that last week. Um, he, um, just, in, just in a nutshell, very briefly, because it's important we understand this background for those of you who don't know. Um, Jacob loved a woman named Rachel and went to her father to marry her. And he said, if you will work for me for seven years, tending my sheep, etc., you may have my daughter Rachel to wed. So he loved her so much. And for those seven years, he worked hard. But on the wedding night, you can read the story, but the long and short is uh, the father tricked him and gave him the older sister. It was the custom that the older sister should marry first and no one else had come along in those seven years. So he had to marry Leah, but he loved Rachel. So he said to his father-in-law, look, okay, I'll, I'll take Leah, but, I, but Rachel's the one I love. So father said, I'll give you Rachel now as well, but you must work another seven years. So Jacob did, but he was honest from the beginning. He loved Rachel, but now he had two wives, the sister, Leah as well. And Leah, naturally being married, she wanted her husband to love her too, but he didn't. He loved Rachel. This is Genesis chapter 29, verse 31. Listen to this. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved by her husband, he enabled her to have children. Rachel could not yet conceive. So here we see God's compassion on Leah. And you would think she would have 
felt that, sensed that. She didn't yet. Listen to this. So Leah became pregnant. She gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben. And she said, the Lord has noticed my misery. And now my husband will love me. Hmm. God had shown compassion, shown his love. But her concentration is on the husband. Not so much on father, God, on her husband. She wanted her husband to love her. But he loved Rachel. She soon became pregnant again. And she gave birth to another son. And she named him Simeon. And she said, the Lord heard that I was still unloved and he's given me another son. Her focus is still here on her husband. Oh, maybe he'll love me. Verse 34. Then she became pregnant a third time and she gave birth to another son and she named him Levi from where we get the Levitical priesthood. And she said, surely this time my husband will feel affection for me since I've given him three sons. But Jacob loved Rachel. It just didn't happen. Jacob wasn't being a bad man here. He was honest from the beginning. He loved Rachel. He just had to take Leah. He was taking care of her, but he loved Rachel. Verse 35. Once again, Leah became pregnant and she gave birth to another son, the fourth one, and she named him Judah. Now Judah in Hebrew means praise or adore. And she said, now I will praise the Lord. And then she stopped having children for a while. She had some later on. Now I will praise the Lord, she said. She named her son Judah. Finally, finally, she came to what was most important of all. Of course it was hurtful that her husband did not love her as much as he loved Rachel. He had always loved Rachel. And her, her, whole, her whole intent, her whole focus was how to get my husband to love me. When she forgot, it was blatantly before her. God loved her. God was blessing her with children. God pouring down his compassion upon her. The blessings were there, but she could not see it. She wasn't focusing on him. She was focusing on what she could not have and would never have because Jacob loved Rachel. I love this portion of scripture, just several verses but it shows us what we've all done. It shows us how we get something, some idea in our head, and we think, this is what I need. This is what I want. Perhaps we beg, plead, oh, God, please give me this. Let it happen. Oh, this will be the most wonderful thing. But it doesn't. It never happens, maybe. The things that we want, that we beg and plead for and tell ourselves, I've got faith for this to happen, and it just doesn't. And finally, hopefully, we come to that place, as Leah did, where we can say, God's ways are better than mine, and he has blessed me so much. I look around, and I can count my blessings. I can indeed. So many in my life, we can all say, and we can come to that point, and we say, Father, I know your plans are better than my plans. Your ways are perfect. Mine are not. Your ways and plans are, oh, past my imagination even. You love me so much. I trust you. I've been in the darkness of, of despair but I trust you. I look to the light. I love you. My faith is in you. Whatever you want today to bring and tomorrow, I trust you. I praise you. Whew. Like Leah, when we can come to that point in our lives, we are blessing ourselves because we are taking ourselves out of that constant reminder of our misery, of our disappointment, because we're looking not at what we don't have, but everything that we do have in him. We are complete in Jesus Christ. Oh, our life is hid with Christ in God. We have everything we need in him. If only we would concentrate on that and praise him. Ooh, we bless ourselves. We bless ourselves with that peace that passes understanding. So I just wanted to, in talking about Judah, as it was mentioned here, I thought, well, let's go right back to the beginning to when he was born. But there's something else about Judah. Um, I want to turn to Hebrews here. There is a story also in Genesis. Many of you will know this, uh, Abraham. And uh, there was a king who came to visit Abraham. The king's name was Melchizedek. And we know very little about Melchizedek when he came to visit Abraham, bringing some uh, wine and bread for him. Um, but we learn a lot more about him from the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7. Let's start with verse 1. This Melchizedek, 
was king of the city of Salem. Now, Salem means peace and also a priest of God most high. Now, last week when we were looking into Levi, we reminded ourselves that God is now, Jesus is now our high priest. Okay, uh, let's look down to verse three. There is no record of his father or his mother or any of his ancestors. There is no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever. No beginning, no end, a priest forever. Who is that? Well, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He appeared to Abraham in human form. Melchizedek. This was uh, to show us of a new thing that was coming. Let's read on down. Let's see. Uh, when, when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham, Levi wasn't born yet. Let's see. But Abraham was giving a tithe to this Melchizedek, just in adoration to him. It says, although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body. When Melchizedek collected the tithe from him, he received it. Now look, listen to this, verse 11. This is it. If the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection that God intended, making man right with God, then why did God need to establish a different priesthood? Through Melchizedek. And a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. What, what, what is that saying? He made a, a, a something new. You see, when the people would bring their perfect lamb to the priest, remember as we talked last week, this was a sign. Everything in the Old Testament points to the New Testament, points to Jesus. And this was a sign of one day there would be the perfect sacrifice. That was Jesus Christ. When he stretched out his arms and died on that cross, once for all time, the scripture tells us, you and I no longer need to bring a lamb or something else. And that didn't work anyway, as the, as the writer to the Hebrews is saying right here. It said, if it could have uh, achieved perfection, there wouldn't have needed to be another way, but it couldn't because mankind kept sinning and they had to just keep continually bringing an offering in hopes of forgiveness of sin. We still sin, you and I, but the price is already paid in Jesus Christ. When we receive Jesus Christ, he has already paid for and forgiven our sins, past, present, and even future. Now, we don't want to sin. By the help of the Holy Spirit, we try not to sin. And we confess it immediately because we don't want our fellowship to be broken. Our relationship cannot be broken. Our life is hid with Christ in God for eternity. We are his child for eternity. And we will not lose that. But our fellowship, our relationship can be broken in terms of feeling free to come to him. We might be guilt ridden what we've done. We've turned from him and we need to confess and make that right, that we continually are clean before him. But that son daughter relationship with him is forever. Whew, isn't that good? So bringing the priest through Levi and bringing those sacrifices to the priest through Levi actually only proved one thing. It wasn't going to work for eternity. Man couldn't keep the rules. They couldn't even, as we've read earlier last week in Malachi, they didn't even um, honor bringing the, the best sheep. And the priests weren't even accepting the best sheep. They were going wink, wink under the table and receiving imperfection, imperfect ones on purpose. Oh, terrible. So there had to be a new way. So listen to this. If the priesthood is changed, and it is, the law must also be changed to permit it, for the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe. This is Melchizedek. This is Jesus, whose members have never served at the altar of priests. This is a new tribe. This is something new. Verse 14 says it plainly. What I mean is this. Our Lord Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Judah. Yes, this one who was the son of Leah. This one, Judah. Oh, this change has been made very clear since a different priest, Melchizedek, has appeared. Jesus became a priest in, forever in the order of Melchizedek, and he is also king. He is the king of peace. Coming through Judah, we have Jesus. King David came in the line of Judah. Jesus is the lion of Judah. I meant to say King David came through the tribe of Judah, and Jesus is the lion of Judah. He's the forever priest. He is the forever king. It had to be done differently than Jesus could not come through the tribe of Levi. That was to show mankind that they can't keep the rules and they can't be good enough themselves. We know that we cannot be good enough ourselves, but a new thing was done. 
often the, the Bible talks about the new things. One of my favorite is, uh, I quote this a lot, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, for anyone who comes to Jesus Christ, old things are what? Passed away. And all things are become new. New. After the order of Melchizedek through the tribe of Judah. Does that make sense? Isn't that exciting? He had to do a new thing. The Old Testament points to the new thing in Jesus Christ. And we are living in that age of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Wow. Isn't that something? I get excited about that. It, it, do, you see, do you see, as I've mentioned in the past, why it's so important that we you know, do our spiritual deep sea diving into those things of the Old Testament because it brings to light what's happening in our lives and in our world today. We learn so much by looking into the characters of the Old Testament because we can, we can, it reflects us today and, and we can learn so much to give ourselves encouragement and strength to focus, focus on him by looking at the mistakes of those that didn't do such a thing in the Old Testament and by looking at the blessings of those who did indeed focus on him. Oh, let's read on. Verse 12 says, May the Lord cut off from the nation of Israel, uh-oh, every last man who's done this, you know, turned from God, and yet brings an offering to the Lord of heaven's armies. Oh, let's read on a little bit. Here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears and weeping and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings. He doesn't accept them. Remember, he's not going to accept the imperfect ones. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? Well, I'll tell you why, the writer says, because the Lord witnessed the vows with you and your wife. Remember this physical union when you were young, but you've been unfaithful to her, though she remained faithful to you, the wife of your marriage vows, he again, he's making that picture of marriage that you should honor and be truthful to one another. And he's saying that spiritually speaking, we should be honor and true to God. And yet we turn away. They did it in the Old Testament. We do it today. Oh, verse 15. Did the Lord make you one with your wife? And aren't we one with Jesus? Oh, that's what this is saying. In body and in spirit, you're his. And what does he want? godly children from your union. We can have godly children. I, I've never married physically. Oh, but I'm so excited. And I, I just, I have so many children uh, in various parts of the world. And, and, and I'm their mother. I'm their spiritual mother. It's so wonderful. I even have grandchildren because they're going out and bringing others to the Lord. It's wonderful. It says, oh, we talked about this last week. Guard your heart. Remember that verse in Proverbs 4, 23. Guard your heart, Proverbs tells us. And why? because it affects everything you do. We must guard our heart, or we too will divorce in our relationship from God, not severing our relationship, but our fellowship as we look to things of the world that are only temporary. And if there's any pleasure in it, it's only temporary. The best pleasure, pure pleasure, holiness from God alone. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. It says, verse 16, it says, I hate divorce. We know the Lord does, and he hates spiritual adultery when we turn from him. You know, it says in, uh, in Revelation, doesn't it, that he doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He'd rather us be cold or he'd rather us be hot, because if we're lukewarm, he says he'll spit us right out of his mouth. We can't have one foot in the way of the world and another foot in Jesus' camp and say, oh, I love you so much and bless me, bless me, but I'm just going to go dabble over here in this evilness for a little bit, a little bit, but I, I'm really going to come back to you. No, no, that does not help ourselves, and it is disloyal to Jesus Christ. It is a shame and a disgrace on what he did for us on that cross when we, on purpose, say, I'll just turn my back a little bit, Jesus, because this looks so much fun over here. I'm going to do that, but I'll be back. I'll be back. Oh, what disrespect, what disrespect and a smear on what Jesus did on that cross for us. Think of that the next time we are tempted on purpose to turn away for a little worldly pleasure. Oh, it won't bring eternal pleasure. It'll bring guilt and depression, despondency. We don't want that. Who wants that? Raise your hand. Who wants that? Nobody. You don't want that. Who wants joy forever, peace that passes all understanding, courage, strength of God himself? Raise your hand. Yes. Eyes on him. Eyes on him. And that's promised to us. Oh, verse 17. Malachi says, you've wearied the Lord with your words. And you might say, the scripture says, how have we wearied him? 
And the answer, you have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight. What? And he's pleased with them. You've wearied him by asking, where is the God of justice? Oh, let's read that again. You've wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight. Does that not sound crazy? Is that not happening today? Mm -hmm. The Bible says there will come a time in the end times of which we are living now that there will come a time that what is good, what has always been good, will now be called bad. And what has always been known as bad will now become good. I need not even go into great detail. That's happening all around us. And nations, again, being an American, I can't help but think of my, my own nation, America, founded on godly principles, on godly principles, honoring openly from the president down the Bible, the word of God, praying, urging the people of America to pray to the one and only God. Not so anymore. No. America and many nations has committed adultery, turning from God, saying, you're one of the gods now. You're one of them. Oh, but there's this one over here, and there's this one over there, and there's that one over there. Oh, no. No good can ever come from divorcing, committing adultery with God. No, it can never happen. There will never be true peace. There will never be true joy. It cannot happen. And many countries, many leaders, many nations in the world today have turned their back on God. And they go, wink, wink. God, I'm still recognizing you. Oh, but there's these others as well. Mm -mm. No. God is a jealous God because he knows his ways are right and pure and holy. He knows that there is no other way to be saved but through his son, Jesus Christ. And he gave his perfect son to die for the likes of you and me. How can we dare say, I appreciate what you did, but there's some others over here. I'm looking into that a little bit. I'm going to dabble over here. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's a disgrace to what Jesus did. And it's to our own detriment. We don't have peace that passes understanding when we're dabbling in things of the world. It's only through Jesus. It's only through his promises. And those of you who endeavor to live by his instructions of his love letter, you know what I'm saying. You know it's true. This is just one example of the verses I've read to you today of God's displeasure when we turn from him, when we treat as disrespectful what Jesus did on the cross for us. But this happens today. But just as we've seen here, blessings come. And we can say, like Leah finally said, now I'll praise the Lord. We can look at the evil in the world and say, but I will praise the Lord. We can be made fun of, but say, I will praise the Lord. People can say, you're, you're judgmental because you live by the words of the Bible. We don't do that in the world now. We accept everything. Still, we can say, I will praise the Lord. Only Jesus, only Jesus. In our next part of the series, number four, we come into the last two chapters, which are about end-time prophecy. There's four chapters in Malachi. The first two, and then the last two. The first two, they teach us how to be prepared in our heart. Number three and four, chapters three and four, they tell us of what is to come. We've looked at this before. Many of you have watched my series on Bible prophecy and times. Now we're going to look at some more again tomorrow, uh, next week, not tomorrow, uh, next week beginning with chapter 3 and chapter 4. And oh, as we turn the TV on, oh, just this week, we've been all watching what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, more weather disasters all around. We are in those birth pains that Jesus talked about and the contractions to giving birth to what? The tribulation. They're getting closer. They're getting closer together. Oh, it's why I love to read things like this so that we can be ready for that trumpet sound, ready to stand with glad hearts before Jesus Christ, not to be dabbling in the world, not to be committing any kind of adultery, so that when we hear that trumpet sound and we're there, it's like, oh no, he caught me doing this. Oh no. We don't want to be found that way. We want to encourage each other to be true to what Jesus did for us. Eyes on him, not some of the time, all of the time, because why? Blessings come to us all the time. Guard your heart. It affects everything you do. Guard it. And joy and peace is yours. I guarantee it. Oh, you be blessed. Until next time.